What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of The Sit Down. As always, if you enjoy this video and you're watching us currently on YouTube, do me a favor and hit the like button and let me know what you think of today's discussion in the comment section below. Also, if you're new around here, you just haven't done it yet, or you're living on a rock and seeing this video for the first time, I don't know what you're waiting for. Hit that subscribe button below now so you never miss another sit-down video. If you're checking us out currently through audio on our platform on iTunes, Spotify, Google Pods, wherever, welcome in. I hope you enjoy the show. Make sure you leave us a detailed review and give us five stars. I'm your host, Jeff Nado, and we are back with another weekly episode of the show. We are up to episode 105 already. And, um, you know, I got to tell you, this show, probably out of all the 104 episodes I've done, it is uh, a bit different than the normal shows that I do. Um, I would say today's discussion is probably about one of the more polarizing people uh, in the mob world, really. I mean, and what's interesting about the individual we're going to speak about today is he is not a made man. Um, due to not being Italian, he cannot become a made man, but he has become a polarizing figure. You either like him or you don't like him. But I think for me, what I wanted to achieve with this show is I wanted to understand what is fact or fiction about the life of John A. Light. John A. Light is polarizing, as I said, and he is a guy that if you follow this genre, if you're kind of a novice to this genre, if you've seen documentaries about the mafia, you've seen John A. Light. He's been in them. He's a consultant for them. He has made a living over the last 10 or so years of his association with the mob. Now, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to attempt to decipher what about John A. Light's life is true. And what about John A. Light's life is not true? Now, I do believe that some of John A. Light's stories are true, but I think there's a lot of embellishment in certain stories, but I do, and I want to say this really from the top before I really get into the biography, into the life. Do I believe John A. Light was very connected at one point to uh, John Gotti Jr.? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, I think there's proof of that. I think, you know, when you look into the mafia, there are things you have to understand. One of which is even up until like the mid 2000s, even till today, not just anyone can hang around a social club, right? That's important, right? You can't just go into a social club. You can't just hang out with gangsters. You don't drive around with gangsters. They don't take Ubers. Like that's not something they do, right? So when you're getting this sort of involvement in someone's life, it's hard to disagree that they weren't around each other. Look, the truth of the matter is, these are very, let's be honest, intimate family photos, right? These are photos that are unfeathered access and not many people get them. Now, again, do I believe John Gotti Sr. met John A. Light and described him as a shooter? No, no I don't, not necessarily. I don't have any way of proving that. Do I think it's possible that he met him at some point? Yeah, I do. Do I think he was uh, a contemporary to the Paul Castellano hit? Of course not. Um, so what we're going to kind of attempt to do is attempt to understand who John A. Light is and what, if anything, is he telling the truth about? I also want to say this because I think it's important to say from the top. I'm an outsider, right? I'm in the middle, okay? I don't have a relationship with the Gotti family. I don't have a relationship with John A. Light. Have I talked to members of the Gotti family? Absolutely. Have I talked to members of John A. Light and his group? Absolutely. I've spoken to John A. Light. I'm sure I could get John A. Light to come on this show. It's not that difficult. But I think for me, I want to remain neutral and tell the story, okay? Because when you have people come on the show sometimes, they're able to say what they want to say. And I, I want to leave this as a no opinion feel. I want to try to give you what I can give you and tell you what I think. Uh, and we're going to get into the story of a light and we're going to back up some of the stories and we're going to have some questions about some of the stories. Um, so let's kind of get into it. But before we do that, I want to tell you a little bit 
about a new company that I'm dealing with, a company called FitBod. Now, one thing that you guys know about me is I went into a weight loss journey. Okay, I started it in, in 2020, March 2020. And to this day, I still maintain the same level of fitness and diet. Okay, I, I, I have a little bit more fun nowadays, but I, for the most part, stick to workouts and staying in shape because I don't want to gain it back. Now, if you're looking to take your workout to the next level, you got to go and check out FitBod. This is for the people that have lost weight, are losing weight, want to lose weight. You have to get yourself FitBod. Now, it's an app that creates a workout program that's personalized to your actual goals, fitness level, and available equipment. So it's not going to make you do something where you might not have a certain machine or something like that. It also adapts and learns from other workouts that you've had to help you improve. And it's a perfect companion to help you crush your fitness goals as we head into the summer. One thing I love to do is work out in the summer. And FitBot is something that I'm going to personally use to help me achieve those fitness goals that I want to get to. It's all about maintaining for me now. And it's important that you start making progress towards your fitness goals. And by listening to this show, by viewing this show, you're going to get 25% off a FitBod subscription. The app will switch up your exercises to help avoid overtraining, burnout, give you some good recovery time, and most importantly, keep your workouts fresh and fun. Now, whether you work out in your living room or a weight room or a gym, FitBod has you covered. A full year of FitBod is less than the cost of a single session with a personal trainer. That's super important because for me, if you know anything about the workouts I've done, I never had a trainer. I never had anybody help me. I barely went into a gym. I strictly did it through going outside and moving around. And I do it at a low cost. That's why I like FitBod. And I, again, I'm going to recommend it to you. Go check out FitBod. There's no better time to level up your fitness habit. Try it today. You can get 25% off your subscription and try the app free at fitbod.me slash sit down. Again, that's fitbod dot m e slash sit down f i t b o d dot m e slash sit down all one word go today you might want to look like me hopefully you do go get control of your fitness now fitbod dot me slash sit down all right without further ado let's get into the episode and again we're going to start just like we do every other episode John A. Light on the sit down. John A. Light was born September 30th, 1962. Uh, he would be born and essentially spend the rest of his life uh, up until he left the life uh, in Woodhaven, Queens. Now, Woodhaven is an interesting place because it's very close to the border of Brooklyn. Uh, it's very close to the neighborhoods of East New York and Brooklyn, and then in Howard Beach and Ozone Park in Queens. And We've talked about this ad nauseum on the show. We had Howie Santos on a couple of weeks ago. Howie uh, was from this general vicinity. This is an area rife with gangsters, and it has been for years. And one of the families that is very memorable in Woodhaven and Ozone Park and Howard Beach and East New York is the Gambino crime family, right? If you know anything about the history of John Gotti Sr., uh, Fat Andy Ruggiano, who we'll get into, uh, countless people from the Gambinos are from these general areas. And you look at guys like Nicky Carrazzo, that group, they're from Canarsie. They spent a lot of time in this general vicinity. A lot of gangs and groups came up in the area. And John Aylett, I've heard uh, reference Woodhaven as uh, something they would down the road call Death Haven. Uh, John Aylett essentially grew up on Jamaica Avenue uh, in Woodhaven. And he was actually born to Albanian parents. Now, as we know from looking into people like Joe Watts, Jimmy Burke, um, you know, Meyer Lansky, John A. Light being an Albanian would preclude him from ever becoming a made man. We talked about this was Howie a couple of weeks ago. Um, I know there is history that, you know, in certain families, they made people that were half Italian. But when John A. Light would eventually get into criminality, he realized that if he would ever want to be in the mafia, he would never become a made man. Now, that does not mean you can't have the same things awarded to as being a made man. We've seen people like Joe Watts be afforded a lot of respect. And 
when you get a button, it doesn't mean really that much to a lot of people. Now, this to me is important because when we look at later in life, when we're comparing people like John A. Light and John Gotti Jr., this is an important thing to understand because whether or not we want to talk about what John Gotti Jr. did in 2005, the fact that John Jr. took the oath of being a mobster is very important in all this because whether or not you want to argue it, John A. Light did not breach any sort of protocol because he wasn't a member of the mafia. That's something we know. That's a fact. That's important. Now, John A. Light would talk very openly about his life. He actually had one sister and two brothers. Um, and he would talk very openly about his father, Matthew, who was a strict Albanian. Um, John A. Light would say as a toddler, he was taught pretty much how to fight from an early age. He would say that um, him and his brother, Jimmy, would, would, would be taught to box as young as three years old. Now, that is not, um, I think, unheard of. I know a lot of people in the Albanian community um, that uh, have been taught to fight. I think that's a norm. Uh, there are definitely people that uh, enjoy fighting. Uh, they want to have success with their hands if they're ever in that situation. Uh, Eli would also say that he was always encouraged as a kid to uh, get involved with sports, be tough. And according to him, his father would tell him, quote, don't be a girl. Um, now, one thing about John Aylett's father, Matthew, is he was a degenerate gambler. Um, that was something that was pretty widely known throughout the neighborhood. He held like random odd jobs as like a taxi cab driver. But he, I think, w was always wanting to bet on sports and kind of be involved with gambling. Now, I think one thing that we could always take away from places like Woodhaven or Ozone Park or wherever Look, if you played in a card game with gangsters, you were an associate of the mafia. Do I think John Gotti's father was an associate? No. Do I think he might have hung around people that were associated with that life? Sure. I think in those neighborhoods, we have to remember and differentiate. Like whether you live in, you know, Maine or Montana or Iowa, a lot of people in these neighborhoods are associated with the mafia in some way, right? You may have a, a guy that owns an antique store that's a fencer for stolen goods and he's a mob associate. You run into these people. It's not unheard of, especially living in the neighborhood that John A. Light lived in. A. Light would ultimately take up boxing and baseball, and he began to be pretty good as a kid playing baseball. He would eventually get more into the sport, and by his high school years, he would attend Franklin Lane High School in Queens. Now, he would actually play second base uh, for the baseball team, and you know, according to A. Light, he was pretty decent as a baseball player. Um, now, I want to kind of talk about the bridge as he gets into high school and, and ultimately his college, uh, which was a short time. Aloy would talk about um, something that I want to make clear I could not substantiate. I talked to two different people in the Woodhaven area that I know um, that weren't aware of the individual that I'm mentioning. This is a story strictly from John Aloy. And this is where... I think he talks about the first time he was really involved in criminality. John A. Lee would claim that as a high schooler, he would work at a place called Dick's Deli, which is, from what I understand, a, a real place. It was on 79th and Jamaica Avenue in uh, Woodhaven. He would say at one point he got into an argument with a local person called Patty Antiques. Now, I don't have any uh, info on Patty Antiques. I looked him up. I kind of dove through some information and was unable to find a substantiated claim that he existed. Um, but according to a, like he gets into some sort of beef with Patty antiques as a kid, he makes a joke and antiques thinks he's talking about him. And according to a, like this guy wanted to kill him um, through some relationships he had with a person called Albert Ruggiano, who at one point was his baseball coach, who was the son of fat Andy Ruggiano John A. Lake claims that Albert Ruggiano contacts his father and lets him know that John A. Lake's having a problem with this guy, Patty Antiques. Now, he is summoned to Fat Andy's social club, according to A. Lake, um, and he goes to see the, the hawking gangster. Now, this is also where, you know, essentially in the early 80s, he begins to understand who Junior Gotti is. Keep in mind, they're around the same age, but Junior's from Howard Beach. You know, being close kind of in neighborhood locales, you kind of know of people, right? Aylor would say by this point he had never really met John Gotti Jr., but he knew of who he was. It was hard to not know who he was because of his father. Um, but they had run in different circles. 
He would say at the social club of Fat Andy Ruggiano, this is the first time he would have a handshake with John Gotti Jr. Uh, and then he knew him from, quote, seeing him around. Now, he would then meet with Fat Andy. They would discuss this guy, Patty Antiques. And ultimately for John A. Light, Patty Antiques never bothered him again, according to A. Light. Um, again, remember, this is according to him. I could not find information to substantiate this story. And throughout what I do here today, I'm going to try to tell you what I could find and substantiate when I can't. I'm trying to be as fair as possible here. This is a, a, a gleaming look into John A. Light and what he says versus what we know we can find and call fact. Now, Fatty Ruggiano, according to A. Light, would also tell him something else. He would say that Fat Andy told him, quote, avoid that guy in reference to Gotti Jr. He's a punk and loudmouth. He thinks he's tough. No one respects him. No one ever will. And that's a reference of a quote he said Fat Andy Ruggiano told him. Um, now, this is also something that he claims John A. Light would say that Angie Ruggiero told him as well. He also claims that on his deathbed or, or near death, Fat Ant or uh, Angie Ruggiano would uh, Ruggiero would say that, uh, hey, you know, stay away from Gotti Jr. We can't substantiate this, right? There, there's no way we can substantiate it. But I think what's most important about this is this is kind of, I think, where maybe they got to know each other a bit. Hey, that's you. I'm John A. Light. I'm John Jr., whatever. Now, over the next several years, we would find out that John A. Light and John Jr. become quite close. But that's going to be a couple of years down the road because subsequent to, you know, around 17, 18 years old, John A. Light, through his success in baseball, gets a scholarship to the University of Tampa um, down in the, the sunny state of Florida in the early 80s. Now, the problem for John Aylett was his baseball career didn't last long. He would only spend about a semester in Tampa after having an elbow injury and getting Tommy John surgery. If you know anything about baseball, it's a long and arduous recovery. And for someone like Aylett, this essentially met the end of his baseball career. Now he would return to Queens and start hanging around his old friends. He began selling a small amounts of cocaine, started making a little money. Now, according to a -Led, around this time in the early eighties, he was making three to $400 a week. Now in today's terms, it's about a thousand dollars a week. So he's making, you know, let's say 50 K a year selling cocaine, you know, in his late teens, not a bad life. Um, and look, selling cocaine in the eighties, not unheard of. Right. Now, he begins hanging around his old friends and eventually starts hanging around a guy called John Gebert. Um, he would say John Gebert really made the real introduction uh, to him to uh, John Gotti Jr. But again, the problem for John Aylett would come when his father, Matthew, would locate cocaine in his bedroom uh, and decide that he didn't want this kid uh, messing around with drugs. So John Aylett would be sent to live with an uncle in the town of Valencia in California. He would also enroll in a college out there. But again, John Aylip at this point had delved into criminality and he gets into some fights. He would also catch an assault charge, which I would find in California, in that area in the early 80s. He would return back to Queens and he really until the end of his um, you know, career connected to the mob would never leave uh, the area. Um, he began hanging around with certain friends in the neighborhood. Here he is outside of a social club called the Our Friend Social Club. And he starts regularly hanging around with uh, John Gotti Jr. Now, at this point, John Gotti Jr. is basking in the fact that his father, remember in 8485, John Gotti Jr. is a name in the Gambino family. He's a cop of regime. He's making his move towards, you know, kind of winning certain people over. And ultimately, doing the hit on Sammy or uh, on Paul Castellano. So that's that's kind of right around when this happens. Now, I do want to address the elephant in the room. John A. Let has said in many interviews that he was aware of the Paul Castellano hit before it happened. I'm here to tell you, I don't know or not know. From what I know about that hit, I've heard it from multiple people, whether it was Sammy Gravano himself and telling me. I think there's one thing that we can agree on, guys, with the Paul Castellano hit. It was very mum. 
Okay, not many people knew about it. Let's think who knew about it. John Sr., Frank DeChico, Sammy Gravano, Joe Piney, Joe N. Gallo, the, the high-ranking members of the family, the old school guys. I mean, it's probably likely that John Gotti, I mean, I, I'm sure it's likely that John Gotti Jr. didn't even know. He didn't. How the hell would John A. like know? That's something that I think he can use now and embellish a little bit. I think it's probable that he didn't. Remember, at the time, he's in his early 20s. He's 23 years old at this time. There's no prob probable way that he was told about this. This was an important hit. This was a huge hit. And as they say in the film on John Gotti in 1996, Gravano, the character, makes the quote that this is bigger than killing the president. And it was. It was a huge hit. This was in the middle of Manhattan during rush hour. It's very unlikely that John Gotti Jr. knew, let alone John A. Light, who was just a friend of his at this point. One thing we do know about John Aylett and John Jr. is they became pretty close and they would also start making some good money together. Um, by the mid 80s, Jr. Have, had a clubhouse at 113th Street and Liberty Avenue and he had a clubhouse there. And what John Aylett and John Jr. allegedly did was they started getting into uh, the world of sports betting, essentially becoming bookmakers Aylid would say that they had two to three people in the clubhouse that were answering phones, taking bets, and they started making pretty good money. Aylid also continued to sell narcotics, most notably cocaine. He claims that John Jr. was also very involved with this and they were both making a lot of money. Now, I think one thing we can substantiate is that John Aylid was selling narcotics. That, that's not hard to believe at all. He would say that the sports betting operation began to be very successful. And this is where he claims to have met John Gotti Sr. He claims that the successful operation was working so well that John Gotti Jr. essentially acted like it was like a badge of honor that he could take to his father and say, hey, dad, look, I'm ready. I'm making money through the sports betting operation. And this is my friend, John A. Late. We're doing it together. Whether or not this meeting happened or not, I can't substantiate. Now, one thing I will say is there is footage of John A. Light seen around the Ravenite Social Club, okay? Whether or not we want to say that he slept over at Junior's house, I can't substantiate that. Not many of us can. In fact, we may never be able to, okay? That's just the truth. Do I believe, though, that it's possible that John A. Light surely, I, I, I'd, I'd have to say, I hate to think that after one or two times, John Gotti sees this kid hanging around. He doesn't ask, hey, who is that guy? It's probable. Do I think he met Gotti Sr.? Sure. I don't think that's out of the question. The intimacy of being close to these people, you're, you're not going to hang around if, if no one knows who you are. Okay? It's just not going to happen. And that's something that even the most, people know this from, 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 from birth. You don't go to a neighborhood you don't belong to, right? I don't go hang out in a certain neighborhood where I'm, I just don't do it. No one does that. You're told stay out of here. You know, you know, stay with stay with where you are. Don't don't go in a neighborhood at dark. You know that that's normal. Um, do I think though that John Jr. was always looking for his father's approval? Sure, and he probably said, "Hey, look, that I'm in this life now. I'm making money." And John Jr. wanted to be made. He wanted to make his dad proud, just like any other kid does. Now, obviously, he's in criminality, so it's a little different. But I think they were definitely doing some things. Look. I'm going to say this for the last time. I think it's clear. John A. Light and John Jr. were very close at one point. Uh, I think John Jr. would probably tell you that. I think they definitely hate each other now. But look, again, these, these photos are hard to ignore. I mean, you, you don't hang around someone like this if, if you don't like them and, and, and consider them very close to you. Um, now, at one point uh, during this subsequent meeting with John Sr., John Sr. says, according to A-Light, that he's told by Sr. and Jr. that they're going to go into business with Willie Boyd Johnson, and that's going to take their business to another level. Um, and, you know, they claim to kind of make a good amount of money uh, in the sports betting world. Uh, John A-Light would also make an interesting claim. Now, this is another wild unsubstantiated claim I can't make, but he would also say at one point that he began um, dealing with someone called Joe DeLuca. 
uh, a customer who he started to wonder how he was making uh, so such big bets. He was like a young kid. He had a job uh, as a groundskeeper, as what he thought, working for the Mets. I guess this kid tells him at one point he's an equipment manager and that the bets are actually for Mets players. That is not a substantiated claim. We would find out, though, down the road, though, that certain members of the Mets, including John Franco, were very close with the mob, um, particularly the Bonanno crime family. Is it out of – is it possible? Sure. I mean, athletes like to gamble. We've seen that very recently in the NFL. I mean, NFL players are getting busted for gambling. Do I think it was different in the 80s? Yeah, they weren't betting legally. They were betting illegally. I don't think that's out of the question. Um, but again, I'm trying to include what can be substantiated and what can't. Now, uh, John A. Light, by 1988, uh, is you know moving around with, with, with John Jr. Um, and, and John Jr. would agree with that. He said many times that in the late 80s, John A. Light was very around, and these photos prove that. John A. Light would also say, though, he began to become close with uh, a person called Ronnie One Arm Truccio. We've talked about Ronnie One Arm. I'll include the video right here. Uh, Ronnie One Arm was uh, very involved uh, in Woodhaven Ozone Park. Very known, you know, very much a a powerful guy in that area. We talked about him under uh, the interview with Harry Santos, and he talks about he starts kind of laying some groundwork because, according to A Light, he wants to kind of move away and start spacing out and doing other things. You're getting involved in legit businesses and things like that. And he becomes pretty close with Ronnie one arm Truco. Now I do want to talk about more of uh, an interesting connection that Gotti has uh, to a light, but I want to first talk about uh, one of the first murders that John a light claims he's a part of a person in late 1988 is killed called, called George Grosso. A light would claim that, According to him, on orders from John Gotti, he personally shot Grasso three times, uh, and this had to do with the drug trade. Now, I want to make this clear. All these murders that I'm going to talk about, whether it's George Grasso, John Gebert, Bruce Goderop, you know, Louis De Bono, all these hits are murders John A. Lake claims to be either a part of setting up or actually doing i'm going to tell you now and this is just my opinion i think it's possible john elite did one of these murders he would down the road have to face charges on a lot of these um which we'll get into but a lot of them were conspiracies right because we would find out who the actual killers of Goderop and gebert were down the road uh which i'll talk about um so in the late 80s, you know, John A. Light is, is like, what, 25, 26. He, according to him, commits his first murder. Now, he would also say, John A. Light, that John Jr. allegedly told him not to bury the body, not to put it in the ocean. He would claim John Jr. told him to put Grasso's body in the street so that everybody sees it. Again, a claim that he makes. Uh, there's no way we're ever going to find that out because Grass was dead, and Junior obviously is not going to say that. So this is again, I, I think what John A. Led's done over the years is he uses his position in things that he knows no one can really substantiate, and say, "Well, I was definitely connected, so it's probable." Look, I think John A. Led's a smart guy, I really do. Look, do I believe everything he says? Of course not. But most of these people that watch these videos do believe it. Now, for me. I'm smart enough to go look into this stuff. I know that this is a lot of John A. Light's word against John Jr.'s word. But as I've said before, I think John A. Light and John Jr. are very similar people. They both told, okay? It's that simple. I, I, and we've gotten into that before on this channel. I, I don't care where your positions are. If you have a wide open mind, you have to understand. Now, John Jr. never sat on a stand and said, that guy did this, that guy did that. But if we're looking at breach of mob protocol, John Jr. definitely did that. We'll talk about that. In the late 80s, as we know, early 90s, there are some weddings in the Gotti family. Now, in 1984, Victoria Gotti marries uh, Carmine the Bull Agnello. And we've talked about that uh, on uh, many occasions. Um, now, what's interesting about this photo is how many groomsmen there were. I mean, just a, a wild amount of groomsmen. Uh, now, I know it's hard to see, but there are three little ch uh, children, uh, girls. If you look behind the 
if, if we're looking at it from Victoria Gotti's position, the first little girl on the left, directly above her is John A. Like he was supposedly asked to be in the wedding party. And look again, these are photos. They're hard to ignore. Do I believe that they were photoshopped? No, because this is a government exhibited photo that the government used uh, showing the connections that John A. Light had to the Gotti family. Now, we also know in 1990, uh, John Jr. was married. Um, he would marry Kim Albanese. Now, we would find down the road that John Gotti's registry, he made a list of all the gifts that were given. That, that was found down the road. And we would find he'd make about $350,000 in wedding gifts. There is a gift of $5,000 from a person called Jay A. Light. Now, again, that was written many years ago and recovered. Um, so that's another proof. Plus, when John A. Light was married, Junior Gotti was actually his best man. So we're continuing to show the fact that there was a point in time where these individuals were very close. And remember, I've said this before too. I think John A. Light's ability to succeed in, in, in selling a story is who he was connected to, okay? It's just that simple. I think if John A. Light was connected to little alley boy Persico, I don't think he would be near as popular as he is. We know, and I know, I do this every day, the name Gotti is synonymous with organized crime. And regardless of how you pose a Gotti video or, 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 or book or whatever, it's going to get read. And John A. Light is just, I think, a little lucky as well because, look, he does have a lot of these pictures. He, you know, He's not in this picture, but he's in this picture, and he's in this picture. As the great George Anastasia says, there are two things that are hard to argue. He says it's very hard to argue a wiretap because it's your voice. True. It's hard to argue video. And it's hard to argue photos. So I think John Aylett has used a lot of this stuff to include a lot of facts that are probably true, but they're all surface things. A lot of the things he talks about are not true. Now, as I said, uh, John Aylett claims that in late 1988, he kills George Grasso on orders of John Gotti Jr. Now, within four days, uh, John A. Light on Christmas Eve of 1988 becomes a made member of the Gambino crime family. We know all about that. Uh, he's obviously uh, in a ceremony, not only with him, but uh, Mikey Scars and Bobby Borriello in the uh, apartment belonging to Joe Butch Correo. Um, that, that story has been heard time and time again. But it is a very important point because... Once you go from being an associate of the mafia, the way Gotti was, to a made man, you're held to a different level of standards, right? You accept the oath that you are not going to betray your friends. You're going to do what's asked for you to do as a member of the mob. And that's a big thing for John Jr., right? Because down the road, if he cooperates, well, he could say, well, I wasn't a member. It's not as bad. He was still associated with the mob, but it becomes particularly bad when you uh, approve of taking the oath and you breach the protocol. That's a big thing. And that's a big point of contention here in the story of John Jr. and John A. Light. Now, um, as I said, A. Light continues to you know, commit crimes and he's making pretty good amounts of money right now. He's making money selling drugs. He has a sports book. He's a loan shark. And another thing John Aylett is, is actively doing is, according to him, he's robbing drug dealers. Um, and he claims that he was doing it through assist uh, from a guy called Phil Baroni. Phil Baroni was an ex-New York police uh, officer, and he was using his badge to rob people. Uh, and he was assisting John Aylett in doing this. Now, John Aylett claims in his life he's committed tens and twenties of shootings, beatings, robberies. Um, again, there's no way I can substantiate that. Now, I will make it clear in and when John Aylett is ultimately arrested by the FBI down the road, all those things are included in the documents. Just saying, do I think he committed 40 stabbings? I have no way of proving that. And that's the careful balance in what I do. Understanding that a lot of the things we hear are hearsay. We have to do the due diligence to find it out. But some stuff is really difficult. 
John A. Light would also say that everything he's making, he is kicking up to Junior, and Junior is his essentially rabbi. He's reporting to Junior. He's an associate under Junior. But he would also say that Gotti Sr., quote, looked at him as if he was keeping an eye on Junior because, according to Sr., John A. Light knew the streets. And John A. Light would talk uh, in a book that he wrote about his life that there were times where he'd be at the home of John Jr. and he would hear his father, you know, talking to Jr. and he would say hello to him and, 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 and you know, all that sort of thing. Again, <laughs> I, and I hate to keep saying this, guys, but uh, again, a lot of the stuff that John Aylett says is his opinion. I can't approve of it. Now, the Gotti side will say it never happened, but they both hate each other. So it's, you see where it's, it's troublesome here, but it is a fascinating wonder. Now, there is something that I will say, and, and it's just my opinion on, on all of this. I think the fact that George Anastasia, who I mentioned, he would write a book about John A. Light called Gotti's Rules. And, and it was essentially about John A. Light's life and his axe to grind with the Gotti's. Here's one thing I'll say about George Anastasia. For the most part, George Anastasia is one of the most respected authors in the business. And the fact that he was able to substantiate a lot of this stuff, I think holds a lot of weight to me, at least. I mean, I love George Anastasia as an author. I think there's a level of respect I have for certain authors. There are a certain level of authors that I think are hard or not as credible. Now, it's really what your opinion on George Anastasia is. But to me, I feel like that held a little weight. Um, now, John A. Late, as far as his personal situation, he says that he, by the early 90s, is starting to put some distance between himself and John Jr. And this is where he, you know, again, starts doing more business with Ronnie One Arm. Um, he eventually moves to uh, the area of South Jersey, uh, and he takes up residence in an area called Voorhees Township. He would eventually buy a home in Cherry Hill. Now, all these areas were very close to um, the area of the New Jersey Turnpike, and he could be in Queens in an hour and a half to two hours. So, he kind of starts putting some distance between himself and John Jr. Now, he's still making money. Things are going well with uh, Ronnie One Arm. Now, I do want to get into another murder that John A. Lake claims uh, that he was a part of. Um, one thing about um, the mafia is we know a lot about the murder of Louis De Bono, which would occur in October of 1990. Louis De Bono would be killed under the World Trade Center in a parking lot. Now, John A. Light claims that he was essentially given and tasked with planning the murder, um, but he would also say that he was not at the murder. Um, so him putting himself in on this, I don't believe it. Now, we would know and we do know that Bobby Borriello was the actual trigger man, and we would learn that just from history uh, that would come out, and that's been substantiated by many different people. Um, but again, this is what we're talking about. We're There's no way of really knowing it. And the only per people that would know are a group that have actively said they hate John A. Light. So, again, take it for how it is. Now, by this point, A. Light, as I said, is, is doing a lot of business with Ronnie Onearm. They start uh, heading down to Tampa. Now, John Aylett had some connections in Tampa uh, through some old uh, college friends. He starts getting into uh, some different businesses with Ronnie Onearm, including uh, valet services and at one point having an ownership in a place called the Mirage Restaurant and Lounge, which was an upscale club and venue in Tampa. John Aylett would claim that he was making a lot of money doing all this. Things are going well. Things are doing good. Um, but he continues to try to put some distance between himself and John Jr. Now, I do want to talk about a quote that uh, I would find in an interesting uh, write-up from Forbes magazine. As I said, a -Light is trying to put some distance between John Jr. According to Mikey Scars, he would tell uh, this uh, Forbes uh, writer that would write this story about John A. Light, a person called Richard Behar, he would say, quote, uh, about uh, John A. Light, that there was an idea at one point uh, to kill John A. Light. 
to protect and insulate Junior from crimes he had did with A-Light. But Scars would say that, quote, Junior liked A-Light. He didn't really want to kill him and that he felt A-Light would never actually cooperate. So there is a possibility that at one point, John Jr. starts to think, well, maybe we should get rid of this guy because he knows a lot. And I think that's interesting. That's obviously a different name um, in Mikey Scars, a guy that a lot of people find credible. Um, that's, I think, to me, something interesting. So John's down in Tampa. a doing his thing. He's making money. He's living between South Jersey and spending time in Tampa. The problem for John a was he would uh, essentially, uh, and down the road, be arrested in March of 1991 uh, after he got into a beef with a contractor at his home in South Jersey. Uh, according to him, he would say that this contractor was uh, – having sex in his bed while he was gone and that he had found out and dished the guy beating. Um, he had some guns on him and things of that nature. So he would have to down the road face in prison time. He would spend some time uh, in a Camden, New Jersey prison before he was released. Um, and down the road, he would have to report to prison in the mid nineties uh, for this crime. So you know, he is, you know, committing crimes, he's doing things and he's, continued to flourish and make money in South Jersey. Now, um, he would also say, though, that he was still doing stuff for Junior Gotti. Uh, he, the relationship was a bit more strained. Now, Junior Gotti has said multiple times that by 1991, he claims that John Aylett was chased from the neighborhood. So there are two stories here. The Gotti camp claims Junior was chased him out of the neighborhood a light claims he was putting distance between himself and was actively down in Florida with Ronnie one arm and they were doing business and making money. Now it's common knowledge that John Aylett didn't live in Queens. He lived in South Jersey. So I think that's very believable. Property records would show that um, we do know he was in Tampa records would show that as well. What was interesting though, is this is where it becomes again, more questionable because People start turning up dead. A person called uh, Bruce Goderup uh, is killed. And John A. Light claims that he had some involvement in this. Bruce Goderup was a drug dealer from the area of Queens that these guys are from. Bruce Goderup starts talking subversive, supposedly about John Jr. He starts trying to shake down a bar owner that Jr. had control over the bar. And John A. Light claims that Jr. told him. Bruce has got to go. You, you got to take care of it. Now, we would find out that the trigger man was a person called John Burke. Uh, no relation to Jimmy Burke. John Burke was a hit man in the area and an enforcer. And I have to admit, a pretty dangerous person, from what I understand. He had been a, a, a suspect in multiple murders. Uh, John Burke uh, is actually serving a life sentence. In fact, multiple life sentences for his involvement in the a Goderup murder. At one point, it was alleged that Goderup uh, essentially said, uh, fuck the Gotties, fuck John A. Light. He didn't care. So, you know, coupling that with some other things, um, you know, John uh, A. Light and John Jr. had him killed, according to A. Light. Now, again, we'll talk about the fact that John Jr. would face a trial on this murder and other murders. But I do believe John Burke was the actual murderer of Mr. Goderup. Now, a -Light is still uh, moving around Tampa. He's not only hanging out with Ronnie One Arm, but he starts making some inroads and starts doing some business by the mid-90s with uh, Charles Carniglia. Now, Carniglia is another uh, violent lunatic and individual. Um, but by 80, or by, sorry, by 1996, John a has to face the facts on that assault and gun charge from the early 90s. He is made to report to prison uh, in uh, April of 1996. He would first go to FCI Farrington, but ultimately would end up at the Federal Correctional Institution at McKean in Pennsylvania. Now, I'm not going to get into too much because John Ailey tells a ridiculous story that he supposedly pushed and assaulted Gene Gotti in prison. I have no way of substantiating that, so I'm not going to talk much about it. Do I believe it happened? No, I do not. Um but he claims it does. I'm not going to argue with him. Uh, I'm just going to choose to not believe it personally. 
Uh, John A. Light, uh, as he's in prison, would find out in July of 1996, just months after uh, he gets to prison, that his old uh, friend and a guy he knew, uh, John uh, Gebert, was killed, Johnny Gebert. Now, this is another murder that John Aylett puts his paws on and claims he was involved in. Now, it's through prison records confirmed John Aylett was in prison when John Gebert is killed. So he didn't kill John Gebert, right? We would find out this is another murder by John Burke. Now, what John Aylett claims is he, it was common knowledge, he claims that he didn't like Gebert at this time and he wanted him dead and that it'd be a nice present while he was inside to see Gebert go. So why Gebert was killed, we don't know. It could have been for something else. But John A. Lake claims he assisted in the planning and that where he could find him and that sort of thing. And John Burke took care of it. That's one thing I think we do know is that John Burke uh, killed Bruce Goddard up and uh, John Gebert. And one thing I think I'll say is it seems like John Burke is the real enforcer, right? The real hitman here, isn't it? Uh, that's just what I'm going to say. And I'd love to speak to John Burke. I'll write him and see if he responds. I don't know if he ever will, but uh, I could attempt to speak to him. In the summer of 1999, John A. Light is released from federal prison. He would return home and he would, and this is something that I actually asked John A. Light about. He would tell me that from 1999 until 2002, he would be back and forth to federal prison for different violations. Um, remember, when you go to federal prison, you're let, uh, generally released and put on a uh, supervised release, right? Where you're you know, essentially on parole, where you're checking in and, and you, you making control of your movements, all sort of things. John A. Late would also say by the early 2000s, he knew it was common knowledge that the federal government was watching him. They're building a case on him. Um, and he would say that in 2003, he decided to run, Right. His relationship with the Gambino family is fractured. He's still on record as an associate, but he's making his own money in Tampa and through other uh, wide-ranging activities. He says that he decides to flee, and he goes to Europe. He doesn't go to the shore or, or, or the mountains. He goes to Europe. He had passports. He's from Albania. The family was. And he would say that he would visit multiple countries, different countries. He's in and out. There was an active Interpol warrant for John A. Light. He would say he went to Albania and then he went down to Cuba and then he went to all these different places and would ultimately end up in the Copacabana section of Rio de Janeiro. And he would say he would move around. He um, is seen in pictures, you know, gallivanting around with beautiful women and, you know, looks like he's living the life. But he is a major fugitive and wanted not only in Europe, but in the United States. And you can go on the run for a while, but eventually they're going to keep looking for you. And eventually you're going to slip up. Ten months into living in Copacabana uh, in November of 2004, John Aylett is arrested uh, by Brazilian authorities. He would spend the next two years in the very dangerous Ari Franco prison. Now, Again, I've seen photos of him in that facility as well. And regardless of what you want to say about John A. Light, um, we can't argue this stuff. Uh, I would read an article out of 2014 that many people that were incarcerated inside Ari Franco would say that, quote, it is worse than death, uh, that you're condemned to cells with 30 inmates at a time. Um, and this is Brazilian prisons. I think John Aylett is a tough dude for definitely spending time in them and, and finding his way as an American through them uh, as a foreign national. Um, now, I do want to um, throw in the fact that John Aylett would spend two years at Ari Franco and he'd be sent and extradited to Tampa to face a lot of different charges uh, in 2006. Now, I want to talk about a person called Philip Scala. Philip Scala at one point uh, was in the FBI. He's a retired head of the Gambino crime family, organized crime squad. According to him, up until 2006, John Aylett was absolutely 100% still connected as an associate to the Gambino crime family. So you, again, we have two forms of where John Aylett was, because according to Junior, 
1991, he was chased from Howard Beach and from the Queens area. Philip Scala would say that he was 100% connected to the family until he went to prison in 2006 in Tampa. Now, remember, there's another disclaimer here. The federal government wanted to paint John Aylett as an active associate of the family, and they're going to say things to substantiate those claims. And we'll find out down the road that not a lot of people believed John A. Light's subsequent testimony. John A. Light would have to realize by 2008 that he was facing uh, a bunch of stuff. Uh, he would, um, according to himself, decide that he was going to cooperate. He would say that in 2005, he got information that Junior Gotti had been involved with a proffer session. Now, Guys, I'm not going to go through this proper session. I've done a video on this. It is an absolute fact that John A. Light sat or John Gotti Jr. sat down with the FBI. There are notarized documents showing it. Okay. Look, I'm not going to go through this diatribe of whether or not you think John Jr.'s are at. To me, I don't think anybody's opinion matters. It is a fact that he sat down with the federal government and committed a proper session. It is a blatant violation of omerta he would be called a rat in every circle but because his last name is Gotti, he is not that's not an opinion that is a fact okay and the only people that say he isn't are the same hypocrites that call everyone else rats the fact in fiction is john and Gotti jr sat down with the government he put people's names into crimes that's a blatant violation of omerta and the same question arises, what would his father think of his decision? We all know what he would think. He was dead by this point, so he didn't care. John Jr. and John Aylett are different people, but they both sat down with the government. The difference between Aylett and Gotti is Aylett took the stand and cooperated in multiple trials and did this and did that. But remember, the big difference between these two individuals is John Jr. is a made member of the mafia and you don't talk to police. John Jr. absolutely did that. John Aylett would plead guilty to two murders, four conspiracy to commit murders, multiple shootings, stabbings, and robberies. Um, and he would have to take the stand against not only his old pal, John Jr., but he would also take part in a trial against Charlie Carniglia. Now, he would give testimony in about John Car or about Charlie Carniglia, and Charlie Carniglia would subsequently um, get multiple life sentences for his crimes, and is still sitting in federal prison today. But the real fireworks came in 2009 uh, when John Jr. is facing uh, multiple murder uh, possibilities. Uh, the federal government would claim that. John Jr. was instrumental in planning different murders, including George Grasso, Louis de Bono, Bruce Goddard. Um, he was involved with the drug trade, all sorts of different things. Now, I want to talk about the testimony that John Aylett would give. Jurors would say that after the trial, they did not find John Aylett credible whatsoever. Now, the feds would paint a different picture of Aylett's testimony, saying that he was, quote, substantial and extraordinary in his testimony. It is important to understand John Gotti Jr. would beat the rap through a mistrial and is on the street today. We all know that. He's claimed that he has left the life and it is pretty clear he has. Uh, he has not been around that world for a long period of time. And this is, again, a very polarizing question. Can you actually leave the mafia? Do I think you retire? Sure, you can. I, I think people have done that. Do I think John Jr. thinks that his reputation on the streets is different than it really is? Probably. I think anybody currently in the streets, so I'm saying people in all the five families, I would think they'd probably have a pretty unflattering definition of what John Jr. is. The only people that don't seem to understand it are the Gaudis themselves. But we're not going to go down that road. We have. We've talked about it openly. Again, it's not my opinion of them. It's fact. <laughs> this is all, if there were no documents and we could say, well, it might not have happened. But there are documents. We all know it. Now, there was a pretty interesting exchange in the courtroom between John Jr. 
and John A. Light in 2009. And John Jr. would confirm this in an interview he did with 60 Minutes. Uh, in that trial, as I said, John Jr. was facing racketeering, murder conspiracy, and drug trafficking charges. It's important to understand they're murder conspiracy charges. John Jr. didn't take part in any of these, but the government claims that he was involved with planning them and or ordering them. Uh, and this most notably comes from John A. Light. In the courtroom, at one point, John A. Litt would say to John Jr., quote, you got something to say to me? And after walking off the witness stand during a break, Gotti would explode with, quote, you fag, you're a punk, you're a dog. You always were a dog. To which the judge would admonish Mr. Gotti. Now, Jr. would confirm the fact that he called him a punk and a dog and a garbage pail, um, but he would leave out the one word that I discussed. Obviously, you know that's been common knowledge that he said that. He admitted that he said it. Uh, and we can't fault him for that. By this point, he realized that the one person that could take him away from his wife and kids for the rest of his natural life was John A. Light. And there was no reason he shouldn't feel that way. The question is, who do you believe? For John Jr., it worked out perfectly because the jury, even after the fact, would say they didn't find John A. Light credible. Now, I'm looking at this from the way a regular person, and I don't consider myself a regular person because I have this weird intimate knowledge of the mafia. But when you look at like just a regular person on the street, I think the thought of John A. Light is half of the people believe him, half of the people don't. And I don't know how you, it's almost like me. Some people like me, some people don't. I don't have the ever arcing thought that everyone likes me. I don't have that reputation. So I think there's always a polarizing thought around John A. Light. Is he telling the truth? I don't know if we'll ever know. But one thing I will say, and I'll leave as we kind of wrap this up, I want to kind of bring up Sammy Gravano, and I want to just kind of give my last couple of thoughts on John A. Light. And this is one thing that I, for one, have experienced in talking to so many people, right? I've talked to John Gleason. I've talked to, um, you know, different police and FBI agents. I've talked to former gangsters, Dom Sakali, Sammy Gravano, Frank Fiordolino, Bill Cotolo, Howie Santos. I've talked to all these people. I've even talked to people off the record that have not been on YouTube, people that are in different cities that did time with John A. Light. And there is one thing that all four or five of Fiordolino, Santos, um, these unnamed people that don't want to be on camera, they've all told me, and this is the gods and the truth, they've all told me John A. Light was very feared at one point in Queens. But there is one thing they would also tell me, and most of them would tell me. They would say that some of the stories are a bit embellished, they would say. And I'm not saying who said that. Some of them said that. Some of the unnamed people. John A. Light is a really interesting guy. There's one thing we can say. He was connected to the most powerful family as far as reputation ever in the mob. And these photos confirm that. Everything else is really a question. I guess you just have to make that decision. I will say a few things as we wrap up. John A. Late today um, would ultimately be released from prison. He would actually get 10 years in prison, but within a year, he would be released in 2012. He would get supervised release for about five years, and today is a free man. Uh, we have seen him uh, all over the place. Um, he's been at Albanian pride rallies. He's been on different interviews. He's had his own YouTube show. We've seen him on Vlad TV and Patrick Bet David and all these different media companies. He's been on documentaries on Netflix called Fear City. I'm always asked, do a show on John A. Lit. What's true? What's not true? So I thought it was time. Now, I do want to say one interesting thing about John A. Light. Um, there has been one person that's been pretty vocal on John A. Light, and that was Sammy Gravano uh, on the Patrick Bet David podcast. Host Patrick, but David would ask Sammy Gravano about John A. Light, and he was not welcoming at all. He was very, you know, it seemed like he didn't, <clears throat> he seemed like he didn't like John A. Light, all sorts of different things. But if you remember, 
I mentioned a Forbes article back in 2014. In that same article, Sammy Gravano would say this about John A. Light, quote, he could never be an associate of the family. Nonetheless, if he was Italian, he would have definitely gotten made, maybe even a high position. Put another way, to us, he was an Albanian mafioso with respect. <clears throat> and that comes from a Forbes article written by John A. Light, John Jr., by Richard Behar from Forbes magazine. Now, I would also say at one point that um, about Sammy Gravano, he would also say that he does try to stay out of people's uh, quarrels. Um, but when John Jr. was asked about a uh, Gravano and A-Lite, um, he would say that Gravano is lying and that he didn't even know of Elite's existence during his mob years. Now, Gotti would say that Gravano was the, quote, keeper of our records in our archives, and they had at once put together a roster of all hundreds of members and associates. Gotti would respond, I'll bet you can guess who's not on that list. Gravano would respond with Gotti's quote and saying that he has me mixed up with a historian. I was a gangster killing people. I didn't keep fucking rosters. This is why the kid, in reference to Junior, didn't belong in the life. Really, it was a shame that John Sr. even made him. So this is the issue. We have people that don't like each other, and they're all going back on what they were saying. But Gravano, per usual, has said things in the past, and then he recounts his statement and goes against them. So to this day, was Johnny like telling the truth? I'm going to tell you, no, I don't think he was telling the truth in every single thing he said. Was he a gangster, and did he hurt people? I think that's clear. Was he around John Jr.? I think that's clear. But did he have intimate knowledge of the Paul Castellano hit? No. Do I think he was involved with killing people and was told to do so by John Gotti Jr.? I, I don't know. According to the government, according to the jury, they didn't believe him. Now, you could get 12 other jurors, and maybe they believe him. It's really who you want to agree with. I would just always say, do some research. Go to correct sources. You know, Don't take these people's words for it. Because the one thing I'll say about John Jr. and John A. Light is they are both gangsters who went against the code of what they agreed to be a part of, whether they were associates or soldiers, and they sold out their counterparts and are both out of prison. That's the common theme between both of these individuals. They are both out of prison. They both fight between each other. They don't have the balls of each other to get on and speak to each other. That's one thing about these two individuals that I can't respect. Neither of them will, will, will sit on a panel and discuss with each other. It's been a long time. They both make money off each other. You want to sugarcoat it? John Jr. makes money off his family. The family makes, they all, we all make money off each other. That's just how it goes. It's social media. Get over it. In the end, you have your uh, opinion. We all have ours. But I think if you run around and say that John Aylett wasn't a part of the life, I just think you're not telling the truth. But again, in today's age, people do that. I will end this with a somber point. John Gotti, John A. Light's daughter, Chelsea, um, is one of four children that John A. Light had. Um, he has several sons. In August of 2022, Chelsea A. Light would die at the age of 30. According to John A. Light, she had been involved with drugs and she had succumbed to her disease. I think as we end this, it's important to say that we hope that she rests in peace and that her son, uh, who is left without a mother, is able to get through his life the right way. It's never easy when a young person dies, uh, and uh, I do want to send my condolences to him and his family on the death of Chelsea A. Light. John Jr. is on the street currently. Uh, he is a free man, and he is involved with several businesses. We've not heard much from him uh, recently. Uh, he's been pretty quiet. We have seen him involved with some rappers doing some things with the medical marijuana business, which is interesting. Uh, we've seen him pop up from here and there. John A. Light is 60 years old. He turned 61 in September. I hope you enjoyed this show. And I know this wasn't an easy one for me to do. 
there's a lot of hearsay in this story, um, but it's still an interesting one nonetheless. Take it for how you want. I try to deliver it in as easy and succinct ways as possible. Um, it's never easy, but this one was particularly difficult, especially doing it on my own. So I hope you enjoy it. We'll see you next week here on The Sit Down.